welcome NutritionRadio.org listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry, the university nutrition professor of over 20 years and podcast host of long-running shows like Iron Radio. Come on in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Nutrition Radio. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm a food industry consultant. I'm a professor of about 20 years. Uh, and I don't always say it on this podcast, but I am an athlete of a long time, too, a strength athlete. I was into bodybuilding. Today, we have two guests with us, guest co-hosts. Yeah, I'm Sean Fairbanks, a um, professional tattooer of 28 years, um, competitive lifter of the last couple of years, and general fitness uh, enthusiast. And I'm um, Gabby Fairbanks. I am from Guatemala. I am a mom, a dancer, uh, now a power lifter, and uh, I cook every week, but I cook for uh, a mission. If it's good for you, then it's better for you. <laughs> All right, everybody, we have our usual four uh, bumpers here, four topics that we're going to condense into this episode. We've got food trends. So if you're just uh, checking in, you want to see what this episode is about, if you want to keep listening, uh, we're going to talk about collagen use because it's everywhere. This is a great trend. I'm glad that you, you guys brought this up. Uh, two, in the science, we're going to talk about brown rice. What makes it healthy? Why do bodybuilders live on this stuff? And a lot of fitness people uh, will talk about that, and we'll check in with Sean and Gabby on that stuff. Then in the third portion, uh, the weight management, we're going to talk about, I guess we could call it pig out prevention. So what you might do before you go out you know, with a spouse or partying or to a buffet, can you do anything to you know, do a little damage control before you leave. And then lastly, we're going to do a recipe and we're going to look at uh, Gabby's take on Chrissy's overnight oats. She sort of um, pumped it up a little bit and that's what we're going to talk about. So let's get started. Market news, food and fitness trends. So you guys brought up the idea of collagen use and all the claims. Let's start with some of the claims. Like you said, people are using it for all kinds of things like what? What are what are people using it for? Well, I have a lot of uh, girlfriends that I dance with, and every time that I hear collagen coming up, I don't hear it for anything that is good for you on the insides, like for your muscles, for your tendons, for any of that. I only hear it that, oh, it'll make your skin be shinier and bouncier, and uh, you won't have your crinkles looking up anymore. So I've always thought that it wasn't necessary, but then Sean started reading on it, and since we both have, like, from lifting heavy, we've uh, had some uh, tendon pains and yeah. is that tendon pains and stuff so then he brought up that after also listen, listening to uh, Mike T. Nelson that we should get on that collagen which I again I, I told him joking like I'm already like young and delicious I don't need it but then said, <laughs> no, but it helps with your tendons and your muscles and all your aches and pains so yeah we started researching that and uh, I, I guess it is good for you it's not only for the beauty side of it that girls cling on but it's also for the physical part the sporty part the the powerlifting bodybuilding part there was an interview that mike had with uh, dr keith Barr about some tendon stuff that they were doing i guess uh his his uh, group was bioengineering some muscles and putting them on the side of the fish and making the fish swim around but the muscles were kind of failing at the insertion point so they bioengineered some uh, ligaments and tendons and things, and they were finding that with a little bit of collagen made the tendons a little bit stronger. So I had an injury with my elbow, you know, recently I've been kind of dealing with. So I thought, why not give it a try? And so we've been trying to take some collagen in the morning before a workout. And but, oh my goodness, the collagen. <laughs> not the tastiest of it, drinks in the morning. It tastes mm, like no. <laughs> Yeah. You know what? Yeah, you guys... It, Everybody, before we hit record this morning, um, I was leading into this, but Phil and Mike Nelson and I, we are, we are out in Lake Tahoe, and the first exposure I ever had to a collagen supplement, they, they had these bars. It was just straight collagen. It, they were bland and rubbery, and I just thought, mm -hmm. what on earth? Like, this is – um, how, who said, oh, yeah, this is a food product, <laughs> you know, because, oh, it, it, it was just – it was heinous. But, yeah, I mean – I'm looking at a, a paper from Keith Barr right now. This might have been when we talked about years ago. It was a 2019 where he gave 15 grams of gelatin or hydrolyzed collagen with vitamin C 
mm-hmm. just because vitamin C helps all those cross links form and you know helps yeah. it form and whatnot. And it looked positive, right? The results suggested that the vitamin C enriched gelatin or hydrolyzed collagen uh, may help improve collagen synthesis. This is weird to me as a nutritionist, right? Because when you eat a protein, and collagen and gelatin are considered low quality proteins, they don't have all the necessary amino acids. We used to steer people away from that. Like right. if that was in a in a protein bar, I'm like, oh, they're kind of nitrogen spiking. This is this is not good, right? Because it ends up it's just not as good as something like whey or casein or any of the complete proteins that you can get. Uh, but something appears to be going on in the digestive tract. Maybe you get a couple of these key peptides or amino acids that get into your blood, and they help with collagen formation and and that kind of thing. I will point everybody. I know this is the food trend. I don't want to make this a big science exploration, but the Cleveland Clinic has a great piece. Sometimes I'll go look at Mayo or Cleveland Clinic. Actually, I interned in nutrition at the Cleveland Clinic, um, but they have a great little article on the types of collagen. There are 28 types of collagen that have been identified, and I think this confuses people, right? Because they're like, I see that this product says undenatured type two collagen. Is that what I want? And, you know, this article will point out that's the kind that's in the elastic cartilage and good for joints. And that could be different from like type four collagen, which is found in the layers of your skin. You know, there's five major categories of this stuff. Uh, and some of them are in more than one. I mean, collagen is a huge part of the protein mass in a human body. Right. But if people are interested in collagen, it's a real good like light touch overview uh, about what collagen is. And it's amazing to me because this is the kind of stuff, like I said, it was a cheap protein that I felt like that they just put into protein bars to spike the the protein value. So, oh, look, there's 25 grams of protein in this bar. I'm like, yeah, how much of that is the stuff that doesn't support muscle protein synthesis, you know? Right. Yeah. But in, there's more to it than that. And it is funny, though, to hear what you guys are saying, that people are making all these claims. And who knows? The science, I think, is relatively supportive. So you guys said you guys are doing it. Yeah, we've been taking it in the morning before our workouts this last week, week and a half. Uh, mixing it with water is terrible. It, it, even even the tasteless ones, we uh, Sean mixed it up with water, and uh, that was that 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 worst experience day of my life. <laughs> uh, we we mixed it with some uh, some lemonade, which was a little better, but not that great. Actually, mixing it with orange juice has been the only thing that we've found that uh, allowed it to go down without tasting like. Like the barnyard. Yeah, stuff. because just like you said, you have to have vitamin C with it. So we would have those after slamming the hoof drink. We uh, would take a, a vitamin C tablet, the ones that you just like suck on to uh, to just take it uh, hand in hand. But then Sean thought, oh, what about if we do it with lemonade? And then we thought, oh, what about if we do it with a cup of orange juice? And with the orange juice, it's better. Like it'll stay down. It doesn't want to come back up. So a win-win. <laughs> I just bought a cheap bag of it at Walmart, and I thought, you know what? I'll put a tablespoon in my coffee. That's not really enough, probably. Um, Looking at the dose, it really depends if you're getting one of these specific types or not. Generally, though, what I'm seeing is something like 10 or 15 grams at a pop. I'm not going to put that much in my coffee because I'm not going to ruin my coffee. Like what you guys are saying, this is just don't mess with my coffee. But I thought, you know what? If I'm just having sort of a run-of-the-mill average kind of cup of joe, Maybe I'll throw a tablespoon or two in there. Uh, And, you know, eh, it didn't ruin it. Let's put it that way. Does it mix well in your coffee? It does. And I think the reason it says right on the label of this inexpensive stuff I got from Walmart, it just says, uh, try it in your coffee. And I think it's because it's hot and it increases the solubility and it just mixes Uh better. Because I put it in cold water before, like just cold out of the Brita. I've got this like Brita dispenser in my fridge and Cold water and collagen literally do not mix, right? It just kind of forms these <laughs> strands. And I don't want to choke down these threads of protein fibers. Ugh. Poopy um, fish. Uh, yeah, it's just not. It's just not good. Not yeah. Not good. And I think the hot something like hot coffee or tea might make that uh, different. This is one of those things where I had to change my conclusions over the years. I would have said that's it's low quality protein. It's not going to help build, me build muscles. I don't really want any of that. But now, as it turns out, maybe there's other uses for it. I think marketing-wise, people latched onto it. Uh, and I don't know how cheap it is to make some of these new, you know, the, the specific types and isolate them out and all that kind of stuff. But in the past, I always felt like this was kind of a, a bogus marketing thing. But maybe there's some other uses for it. Like you said, skin-wise, and it's funny, delicious. 
yes. yeah, it seems to be having some benefits. So I, I'm going to watch this trend. The science is emerging, and you're right. Keith Barr did a lot of that. Um, I think earlier stuff and like, hey, this works. And uh, as you get older, you know, collagen breaks down, and I'm with you. I mean, my joints are pretty shot at this point. Um, Sean, my elbow, I had big problems with tendinosis in my elbow and eventually it let go. My triceps just let go of the electron and I just, uh, you know, tore it, tore, tore it clean off the bone. And I don't want any of that to, anymore. <laughs> yeah. So tendon or even the elastic stuff, like, uh, I tore the medial meniscus in my left knee and I'm trying not to have a knee replacement. You know, and I'm hoping maybe if I pound collagen and some glucosamine, chondroitin, whatever I can, maybe I'll delay that. I think it's probably inevitable um, because that's torn. And I, I mean, man, that shut me right down. Yeah. But yeah, it's the benefit of nutrition, I've always said, is the slow accumulation of the good stuff, especially as we age. So. Right. Yeah. Uh, can I ask uh, roughly how old are you guys? Um, I am 41. Yeah, okay. I turned 46 this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Old enough to start feeling it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hit, hit 40 and started realizing recovery was something that wasn't happening the way I was uh, lifting and living. So really in the last six years, we, we've spent a lot more time kind of focusing on nutrition, which I never really did before that. It was always, my, you know, the training and, and what we were doing in the gym and all of that was always dialed in. But you really start to feel once you hit over 40 that, you know, if you don't pay attention to nutrition and sleep that things catch up yeah, there's definitely yeah. things that don't recover as well so right career longevity like it's a thing you got to be proactive you know yeah. all right all right good stuff no collagen is definitely uh like a food and supplement trend and one that's you know like i said science doesn't care what we want so i'm trying to be fair and give it a fair shake and even you know dabbling with it myself <laughs> all right uh next up we've got uh the breaking science Breaking nutrition science. So you guys brought up the idea of brown rice. Uh, yeah. Why? Why did you even suggest talking about that? Well, I was just browsing around on Science Daily and found that article that they were uh, talking about brown rice and the study they just done finding one of the key ingredients in it that was helping with recovery or why it was so healthy. One of the interesting things that I saw when I was reading that was I didn't realize hydrogen peroxide was, you know, the byproduct of your metabolism that was causing cellular issues. Um, and they were mentioning that that was one of the things in uh, whatever it was that is in brown rice that was helping protect the cells from that hydrogen peroxide stress, which I found interesting. Years ago, we were working with a trainer that uh, mentioned that brown rice, even though, you know, it's always kind of been looked at as the healthier option for rice, um, there wasn't a lot of indications that he was aware of that would say that brown rice was that much better than white rice and you know we like the taste of the jasmine rice and the wild rice more so we haven't actually used brown rice in quite a while um, and I just thought it was interesting that there was a study linking back to what the brown rice um, was doing that was you know better for you right yeah um, I'm looking at a paper since this is the science section here Phytochemical profile of brown rice and its nutrigenomic implications. This is a lot of Asian researchers. What, oh gosh, these names, sometimes I, I have a hard time pronouncing them. I don't want to sound ethnocentric, but <laughs> Rabichenthirin. Um, anyway, it's from the journal Antioxidants. It's a 2018 paper, and they talk about all the different kinds of rice. There's even two major categories of brown rice. Here's a quote for everybody. Uh, there are two types of brown rice, which are germinated and non-germinated. Germinated brown rice is obtained by immersing the brown rice grain in water to initiate germination. The benefits of germinated brown rice are that the nutrients found in brown rice are most easily digested and the texture of brown rice is better. Germination has been employed to improve the texture of cooked brown rice. It also initiates numerous changes in the composition and chemical structure of the bioactive components. So even of the brown rice, and of course, you know, there's long grain, there's short grain, there's all these different things to consider. This paper is mostly about these phenols and these different phytochemicals, sort of to your point, Sean, about, you know, what are the, the benefits you're getting when you don't strip away everything but the little starchy portion of the rice and you get all this good stuff. Fiber, you know, there's three or four grams of fiber. There's no gluten, right? I mean, that's bonus. 
yeah. uh, like if you're going to replace uh, pasta or something like that, like Gabby was talking about. It's a lower glycemic index, right? It's slower acting. It doesn't spike your blood sugar like white rice and that kind of thing. Obviously, you're going to get some vitamins and minerals that you're not going to get in like polished white rice. Um, I was interested back in the day. One of the compounds in brown rice is ferulic acid. It's one of the phenols in there. And they used, to, in fact, we were just talking about this on Iron Radio as an example of something that was overblown back in the day. There was an article in Flex magazine and the author was saying, this is a natural, this is the secret. Everybody's going to get jacked. And they were calling it frack at the time, ferulic acid. And it sort of dropped off everybody's radar because it, it didn't really meet the claims, I think, that they were making. But but it is interesting. I mean, they talk about these types of brown rice. Listen to this. It says germination could also induce the formation of bioactive compounds like GABA. So GABA, aminobutyric acid, is something that's been used in studies to help with growth hormone release and uh, lean mass gain and that kind of stuff. So, it, it, again, there's so many different kinds of rice, even the types of brown rice. But I think when you think about all these healthy plant phytochemicals and antioxidants, the fiber, the fact there's no gluten, uh, it's lower glycemic index. It's not going to spike your blood sugar. In fact, you could even get online. There are some websites talking about some of the studies where they replaced white rice with brown rice and people had you know better body composition over time and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, huh. Is this something you guys experiment with in recipes or do you eat it like a utility or do you not really – eat it much yourselves both so i think our diet <laughs> consists in like protein uh and then i always put rice and vegetables but when i was cooking the brown rice now it makes sense what you're saying i didn't realize that germinated i don't know what i was buying because every time that i cooked the rice it became a blob so even reheating it it was just a blob of brown rice so i just didn't like the um, the not the texture but how it it just it just became all gooey. So uh, every time that I make rice, I would buy the white jas jasmine rice now with like black uh, wild rice, but all black so I can mix it up, uh, yeah. cook it all the way. So it's kind of al dente. So I like that. And if not, we make wild rice, but it's more of a tool. So um, I want to make sure that we have the carbs that we're supposed to have with the protein that we're supposed to have with the uh, veggies that we're supposed to have. But yeah, we always play with the recipe to make it fit, well, our taste buds, but also also make it healthy. Yeah, in the last couple of years, I've been on the, the search for size. So, you know, for me, it's, you know, down in a lot of a lot of starchy carbs throughout the day. Right. Uh, you know, trying to, to get as many kind of tasty calories in as we can. She puts uh, bouillon in when we're making our rice. So it's mm -hmm. actually really tasty. But, yeah, we... We typically do the jazz. I like the jasmine rice. Um, we eat a lot of that, and then she likes the the, the wild rice just grain, for the, wild yeah, rice, yeah, just for all the fiber content. But we kind of went away from the brown rice years ago. I guess it was more of that kind of clumpy texture, yeah. And, yeah that we just kind of decided. To yeah, get. I've had it. Yeah, I'll cook it up, and it just forms like a. Um, the shape of the container and like a soft little yeah. brick, brick and you're like gross you know but i i guess just the fact that it's a whole grain is, is appealing i mean like why do bodybuilders lean on that kind of stuff people to try to build muscle it's sort of like the same thing with the yams over the years we just lived on yams and brown rice because you're getting a lot of these nutrients and stuff without the gluten you're getting some fiber to your point though it is kind of hard i remember fortress used to joke about how much brown rice and broccoli a man would have to eat to get enough calories to grow you know because there's fiber and stuff to slow you down it could be yeah. great if you're dieting uh, and i think that's why some guys they'll play around with the rice uh, they'll go with more of a polished white rice. It's almost like what they do with waxy maize and other these fast acting carbs right after they lift, try to get their muscle carb stores back up as quickly as possible. But then at other meals, they're eating the brown rice because of all these antioxidants. And there's some interesting stuff in here about liver health. And I mean, this is a really interesting paper here. So yeah, I, I, the science backs it up. And you know, I'm always going to look at the experiential part of it too. Like this stuff has worked for years and years uh, if you need carbs to get the calories up so you can build some muscle tissue and that kind of stuff, um, it's a good choice. I think it's a good choice. Yeah, I think um, uh, we go grocery shopping on Monday so I can food prep for the week. And I am going to look for another type of brown rice and play with the recipe and see if I can make it less mushy and 
<laughs> and see how, how that one goes. Yeah. I mean, this paper says there are more than 8,000 varieties of rice. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. uh, with different quality. And like I said, there's generally the longer ones have a little bit lower glycemic index where it's, they're slower acting, the longer grain ones. And it says oh, basmati right. rice has unique cereal quality features. I'll tell you, food science goes way deep. And um, a lot of the people that do it for fitness reasons, they just kind of they know that it's always worked, and so they just keep doing it. But I, th this is where we're at. The science is behind it, you know. So, right. Yeah, it's, it's a good point that you're always talking about. Like, I want to make this al dente, or I want to make this the right consistency or texture or whatever it is, because that matters. If it's gross, you're, people are aren't, they're not going to eat it for very long. Yeah, uh, and it's funny. My son, he likes he likes it all mushy because the bites are more put together, so it takes him less time to eat. Versus me, I like the individual little rice that I can just pick up, but he likes the lumps and I like the the little ones. So just finding that happy medium. <laughs> for him yeah, it's, it's almost like grits, you know, where you just cut it into a piece because it's like this solid thing. Yes. You know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good that's a good one. I haven't looked at brown rice in a long time, and as I was looking at this, some of these papers, I'm like, you know what? Not just the vitamin E and the 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 GABA and the you know the germination kind, and there's gamma arisenol and tocotrienols, which are sort of a weird other kind of vitamin E. The fiber, the minerals, there's a lot of good stuff in there. I can see why it's sort of a a staple uh, starch source, you know, for a lot of uh, athletes and whatnot. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, that brings us to our next segment, which is the weight management tip. Weight management tip. Now, we were talking about sort of a pig out prevention or damage control. Um, maybe tell me a little bit about that. Like, what's your approach to this kind of thing? Because I bet people would be very interested. Um, so we work, uh, Tuesday through Saturday and food prep on Monday for lunches and, uh, dinners because we, we don't, uh, my husband doesn't get up till eight and me being a mom and dancing and Taekwondo and all of that. I, sometimes I don't have time to cook in the evenings, but on Saturday we always end up after work at eight, we always end up going out for dinner. So by eight, we're all starving. We're all trying to try healthy choices in our town, but we always, uh, yeah, we always go out for dinner and we're, we're, we're so hungry, but I make sure that I don't want to overeat because we're doing powerlifting and I have to, as you know, be in this weight category. So I'm trying not to overindulge, even though I go for the healthier options. I really don't know how my healthier options in a restaurant are being cooked with all the hitting yumminess with the sauces that they taste too good. I'm sure they're not that good for you. So I always try to either uh, drink a protein shake so I make sure that my belly is kind of full and I get my protein so that way if I en end up munching on chips while the food comes or, or on some appetizers, I got my protein in and I'm not overeating. Um, and even though, like I said, I, I would go for like the leaner protein sushi or something like that, but I, I want to make sure that I have all my protein uh, in first. Yeah. You know, that's a good point. It's not just appetite control, but it's getting in some protein because a lot of times, yeah, you get these appetizers or something in a restaurant and there's, there's not much actual protein there. You know what I mean? You could go nutso on all kinds of tasty fat and carbohydrate kind of foods uh, and there's not always the protein as the main as the main thing. I mean, sometimes there are but. the things that we find whenever we're going out, you know, you, you're looking at the plate and it's all very delicious, but you start looking at protein content after a while. And it's just like, well, there's about two and a half ounces of protein on that plate. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also Sean, he's like over 200 pounds and I am lingering that 130, but we both eat on each sitting about six to seven ounces of protein, depending depending if it's pork or beef or chicken, between six to seven ounces. So uh, I'm used to that. And when I go out, you figure that when you ask for like a beef taco or a beef something, and then you ask for extra beef and you look at it, it's only about four ounces. Like, yeah. it's, not, it's not, it's not, it's not what you need. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because I have a lot of friends who are also dietitians, and they'd be like, are you kidding? The U.S. food supply is built on protein foods. I'm like, yeah, but not by the standards we're talking about. You're talking about, like you're saying, three ounces of some low-quality, greasy ground meat or something yeah. or cheese. The protein is not coming 
in the way that we're talking about, right? So hammering a, a nice 20 or 30 grams or whatever it might be before you leave, um, yeah, there's advantages to that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and and like I said, I eat with my eyes so much when it's after eight. So if I slam, like, um, I really like the protein that we have is, is vanilla flavor. And for a scoop is 24 grams. So I always do a scoop and a half. So I, I, I know that at least I have between 32 ounces of protein. So if I want to, like, eat those chips or, or have a side of something fried, at least I'm not that hungry and I got my protein. So I don't have to worry about that. And I can enjoy the experience instead of just like, oh, my gosh, I'm not getting enough protein right now. And I'm still hungry. And I'm now I'm full of only chips. <laughs> and you know what? You guys are not kids. I'm, I'm telling you, like the more I read in the science, and this is something that I've worked with the food industry before is, you know, sometimes you'll hear the, oh, 20 grams of really high quality protein like whey or egg is going to max out. It's going to optimize muscle protein synthesis. But there's an argument to be made on the breakdown side and preventing the breakdown, but also as you get older, right, there's that anabolic resistance. And that's uh-huh. why you get these, a lot of these products out there on the market. They're specifically, whether it's for nursing homes or patient, cancer patients, whatever, they've got quite a bit of protein in them, like 30 grams or more, because yeah, you're going to slowly become a little bit more resistant to that. It's not like you're 20 years old anymore and your muscles are going to grow at the drop of a hat. You need a little bit more stimulus, a little bit more protein. Yeah. Yeah. On that on that note, my dad, uh, who's I think he's turning seventy two this year, he's been just recently concentrating a little bit more on his uh, his exercise nutrition regimen. He wants to get rid of a little bit of the fluff and feel a little bit healthier and stuff. And he was asking me about protein. I was just letting him know that you know at his age that that he had to actually consume more protein than. More. And, you know, tr- just trying to talk to him about what he ought to be trying to get in in the day. And he's just laughing. And he's like, man, there's no way I can eat that much. And it's just like, well, yeah. I'm going to send you some protein powder then, Dan. <laughs> you know, I'm doing the same thing. My mom is in her early 80s. And I'll, I took over these, uh, like, a, a lot of protein bars, I think, are kind of junk. They have too much sugar, alcohols, and things that are just going to tear you up. But uh, I would take her protein bars that I thought were good. And I'd be like, Mom, it's not enough. On the days that you don't have an egg or two or something like that, do not just have a muffin and coffee, right? That's yeah. not okay. Eat the protein bar instead of the muffin. At least you're going to get 20 grams of protein in you for exactly that reason, right? Because, yeah, you slowly lose muscle mass. It's something like 8% per decade after age 40. And yeah. you, you don't want to – that to happen. Even if you're not an athlete or a weightlifter, you don't want that kind of stuff to happen. Yeah. Um, anyway. Um, now, there's also the idea of satiety, right, in a sense of fullness, and I think that's wise too. I mean if you just ate a chicken breast or you just – Sean, you talked about even slamming some water. I know it's because uh, yeah. sort of medical reasons and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Do you feel like that – does that help with satiety at all? Does that make you feel fuller? Or? I get an allergic reaction in my throat and I can choke when I eat. So far, it's like, well, if I just drink a lot of water when I eat, then it's it's fine. I just wash it all down and it gets through. I drink – probably a quart to a quart and a half of water every time I eat. So it's one of those things that, yeah, um, I've been doing it for so long. It's it definitely, I'm always full when I'm trying to eat and I'm not a fast eater <laughs> because of that. Um, but yeah, I know that, you know, there's times where it's like, I am starving. If I just slam a bunch of water before I eat, then it's not so bad once I get to eating. Um, but like I said, with me, even if I slam a bunch of water before I eat, I still have to slam a bunch of water when I'm eating, which just makes it more difficult to to get the food in in a timely fashion before you start feeling, oh, wow, I'm full and I'm halfway through my plate. So. Right. And I know I think next week, everybody, we're going to check in with Sean about like the challenges of gaining weight, too. Everything you hear about with with calories or law, weight management, it's always about loss, loss, loss. It's like, what about the incredibly difficult process of getting in more calories and protein so you can gain? It is not easy. We're just talking about older people or, you know, Gabby, you're talking about, oh, gosh, you know, two or three ounces of protein. That's not going to cut it. I need more than that. Yeah. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that people are. Oh, I have gained weight easy. Well, sure, you could slam Cokes and Big Macs and just put a nice big <laughs> belly on, but that's not what we're talking about. Gaining lean mass is really, really hard. Yeah, it not is. as not as easy when you're being purposeful with it. Yeah. And especially like you're slamming a bunch of water to get stuff down. That's all zero calorie filler, man. You know, and that's gotta make it a challenge. Yeah. Um Okay. No, that's good stuff. I think that's a 
that's a tip that we've talked about over the years. Uh, I have a, a buddy, a science buddy who also – he was using apples and fructose consumption to try to change like liver metabolism and how that would alter hunger signals and all that kind of stuff. But it just makes sense, right? If you're If you're full of something that you choose to eat, then you're not a victim of eating whatever the buffet has to offer, some deep fried deliciousness or something. Um, or even driving around. I mean, these steakhouses know in these fast food places, they pump that smell into the street, you know, and if you're starving, you're, you're just vulnerable <laughs> and yes. so don't be vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also something that we also do not only to go to restaurants, but if we know, cause Mondays are days off. So that's when we run all the errands for the house and the shopping and anything that we need. And then before I go, I also drink a protein shake, uh, just water and just the uh, vanilla protein because it tastes good just to make sure that if I do end up going to a fast food place, which we rarely do, um, again, I'm not that hungry and I have my protein, my good protein. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. You know what? There's some interesting uh, research out there and I won't bore anybody with a tangent, but spreading it out, getting a nice like 40-ish grams of protein four times a day. It's a good place to kind of start. I know Mike Nelson and I, we both think like this because, you know, the study it was suggesting that you can't dabble around with that muffin and coffee for breakfast and this and that, and then just try to overeat a ton of protein at dinner. Probably not as good as spreading it out. And what you guys are doing, you know, always keeping that protein in mind because of the macros, protein is the less, the least, in my opinion, lipogenic or fattening, if you will, you might as well start each of those, you know, four daily meals or whatever you do during the day with that certain dose of protein that you know is going to be a nice anabolic signal to muscle tissue. And and again, for listeners who don't care about big muscles, protein and muscle mass is not just for weightlifters, I'm telling you. It's, yep. You got to have a certain amount of muscle mass for health and, you know, uh, you know, that's the primary target of where your body deposits carbohydrates that you eat and stuff like that. There's a ton of reasons. So. Yeah, yeah, on that satiety thing, you know, I mean, we're talking about, you know, having protein before you go out to eat. So, you know, you at least get your protein in and maybe you're not as hungry to dabble in all of the, the tasty appetizers. But it also helps to have protein before you go grocery shopping. If you're yeah. not able to actually eat, it's just slamming a little bit of protein before you go into the grocery store so that you're not shopping as hungry. And overbuying <laughs> things that you really don't need. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I mean, I when I would diet for bodybuilding, I would have, you know, rock solid discipline for half a year at a time because you're highly motivated. But at the same time, I would never walk into a grocery store starving because, you know, they do these things on the end cap of the aisles, like ho-hos and stuff that I would yes. normally never buy. And I just do it in my cart. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. it's like, true. Never shop hungry. If you're trying to control your diet and have some kind of uh, – have the steering wheel, yeah, don't shop hungry. It's a good point. Okay, we have one last segment, and that is the recipe. Grant product review or recipes. So let's hear about this tweak on uh, Chrissy's overnight oats. You, you did something to it. Yes. So like I was saying before, I try to eat with a purpose. And if it can be yummy, then it's even better. So I listened to your podcast about the recipe that uh, Chrissy was talking about with the chia seeds. And I remember my daughter uh, a year ago, she made this like pudding and she had, I think, uh, milk and like four spoonfuls of the chia seed and then she put honey and something else and I tried it and I'm like oh that's really good but I went on with my day and that was the first and only time that I was exposed to the chia seeds until you guys brought it up in this episode and then that was uh, me and Sean we were uh, lifting and I'm like huh I'm gonna try it tomorrow because I want to go to the grocery store so I bought the chia seeds and then I was thinking how can I make it yummier and add protein because <laughs> I, I need my protein um, so I put, uh, two spoonfuls of the chia seeds, which are 20 grams of the chia seeds. And that has already about four grams of protein. And then my protein powder, which has 24 grams of protein. And then I am lactose intolerant. So I take coconut milk. So you also have the, that good fat that you also need. And then I mix it up with the oats, but I do the quick oats because they're like more, uh, 
broken down into one right. piece. Right. Yep. And then I mixed it up and I put it in the refrigerator and I had it the following day and it was the most delicious thing I've had ever. And I smiled so much that my cheeks were even hurting as I was eating it. <laughs> so it's like, I'm going to do this again, but I want, I, like, I need to have it always so I don't have to prep it every night. So then we went to um, Target and I bought nine, no, 12 uh, jar, mason jars. And then I set them all out and I put the 20 grams of the oats, the 20 grams of the chia seeds, half a cup of the coconut milk mixed with a scoop of protein. And then I mixed it all up and then I put it in the refrigerator and then that's what it is. And I've been giving it to all of my friends so they can try it and they love it. And it's the most delicious thing ever. And just for people that want to know what the macros are, 318 calories, uh, 30 grams of protein, 18 carbs and 12 fat. All right. Mm-hmm. You know, so, it's a good call with the coconut milk. Uh, coconut has such a unique sort of mouthfeel to it. I bet it makes it really delicious. It is. Um, um, and also, I feel that it fills me up. So it's just it's just good. And like I said, I try to eat with a purpose. And if it can be yummy, even better. Right. Well, and it's lactose free. Like you said, I mean, that's something we deal with in my house, too, is you got to yeah. think about, you know, we've tried it with almond milk, um, lactate milk. You know, because I like just you know, a good blast of casein from just some, you know, uh, lactose removed milk kind of thing or broken down milk. Uh, I like it. Um, as you know, I've been playing with that myself. It's just so convenient. It's, it's the perfect like when we do the pre prep, typically we'll do stuff like a bunch of chicken tenders or chicken breasts or something. We'll just kind of pan sear them, you know, with some Pam type spray and we'll, we'll like for the week, just so we have something to reach in and grab. Because if you don't have something grabbable, it's hard to comply with, with any kind of diet plan. And this is another addition to that. Now, now we got the, the phytochemicals from the chia seeds and, and the oats. And we did the same thing that you guys did. I started with old fashioned oats, which is what, what I used to make in the morning when I had my oatmeal and blueberries, which I probably do about, you know, I've done half my life, uh, mm-hmm. but but the the more pulverized kind of broken down quick oats. Uh, I know that might make the glycemic index a little bit higher, but eh, you know, it, it forms that kind of gel, like you said. The they're just yeah. it's just delicious. It, it's not when you think gel, it could be gross or it could be good. This is the good kind, everybody. This is <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw a couple of um, blueberries in there and that kind of stuff, like after it already sets. You know, the next morning when I just throw it in and. Um, yeah, the chia seeds is sort of the, the golden thing. And I also did what you did with the protein because, you know, uh, Christy was suggesting yogurt. That's good protein source. Why not? A lot of good nutrition in there. But if you want to jack the protein up a little, uh, yes, the whey protein or some kind of milk protein mm-hmm. will work. It will work yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. And then, uh, like I said, I did like 12 jars at once. And the same gooiness that you had the following morning is the same gooiness that you had four days later. So it doesn't it doesn't become, uh, sorry for my English, it doesn't become more gooier as it sits longer. Yeah. So it's always consistent. So I like that. Um, and also like you grab and go because we're always on the go. So I eat that like an hour after we do a heavy workout. Um, so I just grab that and I know that I'm, I'm, I'm eating like what I'm supposed to be eating. I don't have to think about it. You know, that's a good, just the reporting that it doesn't break down. Like I would think that too, like sometimes things that are certain consistency four days later, it's kind of separating and getting liquidy or, yeah. or lumpy or something weird. And that doesn't seem to happen with this. So, um, yeah, that's good in itself. And I love the idea with the ball jars. Because they're all just there. You just reach yeah. in. Because I've been doing this just like three or four. I'll just use like little Tupperware screw top things at a time. But then I'm always left like midweek thinking, oh, man, I wish I had more of that. Mm-hmm. You know? And so you've got a whole like case ready to rock. Yeah. And then I, I kept bringing it to the shop and give it to one of my coworkers. And then uh, I would divide it. But, I mean, sometimes – he had more, I had more. So, um, again, I just rather just make a whole bunch and I know how much is in each jar. Just mix it up and eat it. And awesome. It. <laughs> yeah, it's a good tip. All right. Well, we're out of time, everybody. So that's our four topics. We got the food trends with the collagen. We got the science of what makes brown rice healthy, some weight management tips, and then even uh, that recipe. Next week, Sean and Gabby are going to join us again and for the next couple of weeks. So we're going to dive into some of these other topics as well. So, Yay. Thanks, guys, for joining us. (laughs) Thank (laughs) you. All right. We'll we'll, uh, we'll see everybody next week. Bye. Bye. 
the nutritionradio.org podcast is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, check with your physician, nutritionist, or qualified exercise physiologist in order to make the progress that you need.